<clears throat> Welcome, everyone. We're so glad to have you with us this morning for an up-close look at some of our favorite fossil finds discovered right here in the heart of Los Angeles. So thank you for joining us today. My name is Agnes and I work with the education team at the Librea Tar Pits. So as you can probably tell, I'm not at the museum right now. I'm at home like many of you, but we do have some amazing staff that still need to go into the museum to help take care of our excavation sites and of course our fossils. So as I mentioned, we're going to try and get to as many questions as we can, but Sean may also answer a lot of them during his presentation. But if we don't get to answer your question today, I encourage you to write it down so you can learn more about the animal on your own. So if you'd like, go ahead and grab a piece of paper and a pencil so that you can record your experience while you're watching with us today. You can note down any of those questions you have, maybe a few facts you learned, or draw or write a description of what the fossil looks like. And we love fan art of our fossils here at the museum. So if you have any pictures you'd like to share with your teacher, they're welcome to email it to us at school programs team. Here's some sample vocabulary words that you may hear this morning. So go ahead and feel free to jot them down or grab a screenshot so that you can review them later. So we have fossil, matrix, megafauna, paleontology, Pleistocene, and preparator. You may already be familiar with some of these words. And this is the animal we're going to meet today. So this is the animal we're featuring. And you may be surprised to hear that this Harlan's ground sloth was living here in Los Angeles 11 to 55,000 years ago during the Pleistocene, the last ice age. So let's get started. I am going to switch our cameras over to Sean so we can meet today's ice age animal and you'll see me again in a little bit. Hi, Sean, are you there? Hello, can you see Hello, me? Hello, Sean. Hi, hi everybody, how are you? So we're gonna be talking about sloths in general today. I'm gonna to go a little bit into their evolution. And then at the very end, we're gonna be focusing on the sloths that are found specifically at La Brea. And just for reference, where I'm sitting right now, this is in Project 23, this is box 13. The specimens that have been coming out of here, a couple have been dated using radiocarbon dating and they've been about 32,000 years old. And we have an adult brown sloth and a juvenile little baby one coming out of here as well. Okay, with that, we're gonna start with the slides that we have prepared. Uh, the first thing that we're gonna talk about is Xenarthra. So Xenarthra is a super order. So a taxonomic breakdown, we're gonna be going through a few different, uh, so like there's kingdom phylum, class order, species, uh, genus species, all of those. Um, Xenarthra is considered a super order and Xenarthrans include all the sloths that have ever lived. Uh, so the first couple that you see in those images are the modern day tree sloths. So uh, we'll talk about a little bit of those later. We also have anteaters, uh, pampatheres, glyptodons, uh, armadillos, and obviously the extinct brown sloths. So Xenarthrans, what a common factor and what was uh, a, a common trait early on in the evolution of Xenarthra, all the way back uh, believed in the Mesozoic, so the time of dinosaurs, the, these animals already started to come about. And what happened was these mammals developed uh, extra processes and articulations in their lower back and pelvic area, and that uh, helped the animal to dig. So it was a fossorial animal that was digging um, and it really strengthened the back so that it allowed them to use those front arms for digging and things like that. And those extra processes and joints and articulations in the lower back area exist in all the Xenarthrans even to this day. And they're used for slightly different purposes. So like modern day tree sloths are living in trees. They're not really digging as much, but they, it helps aid them for other things as well, such as hanging and things like that. Um, so we're going to go on to uh, the next slide. Uh, the, sing the Singulata, these are an offshoot of Xenarthrans. Um, we actually don't find India, any of the cingulates in at the La Brea fossil site. Um, so we're going to go over them very briefly. 
they have armadillos, pampathirs, glyptodons. So the pampathirs and glyptodons, uh, they are large, very large, heavily armored animals. So all of these animals have osteoderms. Osteoderms are bones that grow in the skin of the animal. And specifically for the cingulates, they, their bones, uh, the osteoderms grew on the top portion and made things like a carapace or top covering. And they actually had keratinous sheets because they're surficial, they're right at the surface. Um, and they did get into Central and even North America a little bit, um, but they did not reach, get all the way over to California and the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, so yeah, cingulata means belted ones or saddle shape, and it refers to the osteoderms, uh, those protective bony layers that protect those animals. Okay, so we're gonna be moving on in the next slide. And we're gonna move into pylosins. So the pylosins are the hairy ones. And the hairy ones are things like anteaters, tamanduas, and then also the modern day uh, tree sloths, like what we are showing right here on this slide. So we have Bradypus, which has four different species and they live in Central and South America, specifically in the rainforest and up, up in trees and Coalipus, which has two different species. Uh, so this is the three-toed and two-toed sloths. Um, and they're actually separated by uh, a long period of time based off of their genetics and even morphology. Um, and so they separated maybe as far as 35 million years ago from each other, even though they convergently evolved to do very similar things in very similar areas. Um, so all of the sloths and xenarthrins are in the Americas. They evolved in South America and many of them are still there today. They're some scientists argue about whether or not some fossils that have been found in West Antarctica are actually from xenarthrins and even a sloth, but those are heavily disputed and the scientists are kind of arguing about whether or not the fragmentary remains represent those xenarthrins and those sloths. Uh, so the sloths definitely date back to the Oligocene, which is many, many millions of years ago. Um, and they seemingly started in South America. Um, and the, the modern day tree sloths are very, very different from the ground sloths that we find at the La Brea and that are found throughout the Americas. Um, they're very weird and strange animals. If anyone has any specific questions about them later, we can talk about them. But yeah, they do totally different things. They hang from trees. They eat nothing but leaves for the most part. Coalipus eats certain other things like uh, bird eggs and very slow vertebrates and things like that. Um, and they use the, their fur to collect algae and moths and other commensal uh, insects like beetles. Um, and they actually drink water right off of their fur sometimes. Very interesting, very unique uh, enigmatic species, but very different from the ground sloths that we're going to be talking about. So we're gonna go into the next slide. So this is very complex. Um, this is a family tree, so this is are the scientists breakdown of what, uh, where all the sloths lie within their evolutionary history. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see morphology, uh, a, a tree based off of morphological traits. So morphology is the shape and size of bones. So we've been finding sloths since the 1700s. Um, so even before uh, dinosaurs were identified and known to science, we've known about sloths and some, and sloths were some of the first fossil mounts in museums anywhere. And even Charles Darwin found sloths on his trip uh, in the Beagle. Um, and so different scientists throughout the centuries have been identifying remains of sloth and trying to figure out the different families and uh, genera and species, and then trying to organize them into a family tree and see how related they are uh, based off all of that. And the morphology tree, that which has been the one that's been revised for hundreds of years now, came out a certain way, but the genetics is actually saying a totally different story than what the shapes of the bones are telling us. So in 2019, there was a really large paper that came out with, involved many, many scientists. And they looked at ancient DNA from a variety of different uh, known fossil remains. So they were using their fossil fragments of bone, full bone, even coprolites, fossilized dung from different species of sloth. And based off of that, they actually kind of almost totally reordered 
how uh, the family tree of sloths is organized and then also when they split apart from each other and there's a lot of new uh, very very interesting information that's informing us about what's going on with these sloths based off of the genetics um, so even like how closely were the two-toed sloth and three-toed sloth to other different species even that is being reorganized right now as we speak based off of genetics uh, so just to talk about a few of these sloths sloths at the very top you can see there was actually caribbean sloths uh, so the a variety of genera and species living on the caribbean islands and they seemingly got there over 30 million years ago um, and it looks like there was potentially a land dispersal of ground sloths into the caribbean area when there was an attachment of the caribbean islands to the mainland of south america and then as sea level changed and uh, there was uh, multiple islands that formed out of that, they diversified into a great uh, variety and diversity of different sloths. And then we have Coalipus, which is the two-toed sloth. And then we have uh, the Mylodons, which we're gonna talk about. Um, so Paramylodon is one of the fossils that we find here at La Brea. Megatherium, uh, so that involves like Megatheres and Arimatherium. Um, and those are the largest sloths that ever grew and they live mostly in South America, but also in Central and North America for some of them, for the Arimatheres. And some of those animals got to the size of elephants. They were so large. Um, so those definitely weren't hanging from trees most likely. So they're definitely ground sloths. Um, and then we have Megalonics, which we find uh, here at La Brea, and Ophitheriops, which we find here at La Brea, um, and Bradypus, which is the three-toed sloth, which is still extant, still living in uh, Central and South America today. Um, one last thing I'm gonna talk about this is that, uh, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about it, but you really need to look it up. It's such a cool story. Um, researchers such as Dr. Greg McDonald, who's one of the world's leading um, researchers in sloths, uh, found sloth species off of the coast of Peru, like Thalassocnus, and there was sloths that, had adapted to a marine environment that were eating seagrasses in the ocean, which is really fascinating and cool and totally different. So it was a ground sloth that evolved to go into the ocean. Super cool. Really, you need to look that up and research it, but we don't have enough time to talk about them too much today. Um, so we're gonna move on to the next slide. So we're gonna start talking about Pleistocene sloths. So Pleistocene sloths specifically in North America. Um, so Arimatherium lorillardi is the largest sloth to ever make it to North America. They were over 7,000 pounds, really large animals. They came up through Mexico into Texas and then got all the way over into Florida and other Southern states. And uh, you can see on that distribution map, map on the right-hand side, there's a black dot for different fossil localities where they've identified this species. And there's one dot that goes all the way up to New Jersey. So there's an outlier um, in New Jersey, which is really interesting, um, kind of anomalous, but that seemingly was an older dated specimen. So uh, to talk very briefly about the ice age, we're in the Quaternary Ice Age, um, which has been going on for at least two and a half million years. And there's fluctuations of uh, warming and cooling, and those are called interglacials and glacials. So during a glacial, uh, the earth cools down and the ice sheets spread and the glaciers spread and become more massive. Um, and then in interglacials, it warms up and they recede and melt away. And during an interglacial, it seems like Arimatherium lorillardi made it into New Jersey, which is really interesting. Um, but then once the ice sheets expanded during the last glaciation, the Wisconsin, with the um, glacial maximum around 18 to 25,000 years ago, those populations probably died out in those areas. Um, so it's called the, uh, the Pan-American ground sloth because Arimatherium lived in South America, Central America, and made it into North America. And it was only one of a very few sloths, pretty much the only sloth that ever made it to all of those spots um, and lived continuously um, in all of those areas. Very, very interesting story. But as you can see, there, the remains of those sloths in North America are confined to the Southern states 
and on the East Coast primarily, and did not make it to California and the La Brea Tar Pits. So we do not find any Arimatherium, even though that would be really cool to find that. We have never found any of that material at the La Brea Tar Pits in particular. Okay, so we're gonna be moving on to the next slide. We're gonna be talking about the Paramylodon harlani. This is the most common ground sloth that we find at the La Brea Tar Pits. We have over 9,000 specimens that have been curated into our collections and are housed inside our museum on site in here, here at Hancock Park. Um, so that includes every element of the skeleton and most of them multiple times over. Um, and we've been able to reconstruct entire mounts based off of all the material that we found. And we've even uh, donated some specimens and loaned them out to other museums, usually back in the early 1900s. Um, and you might even see these mounts elsewhere in the world, um, made of all real fossil bone found right here at La Brea because we have so much of that material. So um, those animals were about 2,000 pounds. Um, they're really large. And here's actually a fossil replica of a real skull that was found here at La Brea. You can see these are really large creatures. This is the, the, just the top part of the skull. We're missing the mandible, the teeth um, in, the, in the lower jaw. Um, we do have the teeth up in the upper jaw. We have, uh, their teeth are really, really interesting. So uh, they used, all sloths and xenarthrins used to be referred to as edentates. That's kind of an out uh, modeled term because it, it means toothless because, you know, anteaters are toothless and things like that. But um, in reality, many of the xenarthrins do have teeth even though they're reduced. So for all sloths, they've lost all of their incisors, their front teeth and their canines, their sharp teeth. Those are completely gone. And the rest of their premolars and molars have been modified into what is called malariforms. And in, we're gonna talk about a little bit uh, more in particular, the canineiforms. Uh, so you can actually see a, a kind of a vestigial canineiform right here. It's this little teeny tiny tooth that kind of is acting like a canine, but really in paramylodon, they're being lost um, and they focus mainly on the malariforms and the paramylodon ground sloth is more of a grazer. So grazing animals eat things like grasses and there's a few ways you can tell. So based off of the teeth, based off of their peg shape um, and then also based off of their muzzle width. So how wide the muzzle is of a creature can help sometimes determine whether or not it was a browser, something eating a lot of shrubbery and leaves and picking specific parts of plants, or whether it was a grazer eating like grasses and just putting it, its head down and kind of mowing like a lawnmower. Um, so like bison have really wide muzzles, but, uh, and they're grazers, but deer have really narrow muzzles because they're uh, picking young shoots and leaves and different parts of plants. Same is true for the sloths. They have this really wide muzzle in the paramylodon uh, it's, it, and it's better adapted for grazing um, along with the teeth. And um, another interesting fact about the teeth is that they have completely lost their enamel. They have no enamel and they're ever growing. Uh, so it's called hypsilodont. Um, so their hypsodont means that the crown is bigger than the root. And then the celodont uh, refers to the ever growing portion of the tooth. So the teeth are ever growing. They're never gonna wear them out. Um, and they can continue to break down all of those difficult to break down plants, grasses, and then the grit that gets into their uh, plants as well. So if you're in an open area like a grassland, you're going to get a lot more dirt and particles and it's going to break down your teeth faster. So it's really good to have ever growing teeth. Um, so for paramylodon, uh, we're going to go to the next slide. And we're going to see trackways that have been found. Um, so not at La Brea, but in other parts. Uh, so that specifically these tracks that I'm showing you were found in Carson City, Nevada in the US. And um, they were actually building a prison in the 1860s. Um, and they found tons of trackways when they were doing this. And they see how the foot was rotated. And you can see that mostly it was just, it's actually a, a foot, not a hand, but I'm gonna show you my hand because that's what you can see. They were using just the sides of their feet to walk along, which is really interesting. Hi, Sean. I just want to just, um, this is fascinating. We're learning so many interesting facts about sloths. Um, we do want to make sure we get to some of these questions that are coming in. 
Um, so we just have a couple more minutes for the slides and maybe we'll jump over to the Q&A. Okay, and then we're Thank gonna you. move really quickly. So we're gonna go to the next slide. And we're gonna talk about the dermal ossicles. So paramyelodon has thousands and thousands of dermal ossicles that have been found at La Brea. Um, and those bones actually grew inside the skin. So like the cingulates that have bony armor, the, that was completely lost in the pylosins, the sloths and anteaters. But in the late stages of certain sloths, the myelodonts, uh, they actually started growing bony armor again, which is really, really fascinating and interesting. Um, and that worked as bony armor to protect the, the ground sloths. And then their fur is really thick. Um, sometimes it was over six inches, uh, really dense and coarse. And all of those would be defensive mechanisms because they weren't very fast animals. Uh, so predators, uh, in order to defend themselves against predators, they developed different defensive tactics. Next slide, please. So note the theory of Shatensis or the Shasta ground sloth. Uh, this is the second most common large, uh, second most second most common ground sloth found at La Brea, uh, with 475 curated specimens. Um, it's found in uh, over uh, 11 different deposits, um, so it's nowhere near as common as the paramyelodon because that has over 9,000 and it's found in over 28 deposits. Uh, both Nothotheriops and paramyelodon we're finding in the collections at Project 23. But the Nothotheriops, we've only found two specimens. One was a kneecap in box one. Uh, and they're more adapted for more of a desert-like condition and they have uh, more browsing. So we're gonna go into the next slide. And they, we found fossil dung and poop from Nothotheriops in America in places like Rampart Cave and Aden Crater and um, uh, not in Gypsum Cave, but we found a lot of their bones and fur and things like that um, in that area. So all throughout the Southwest, we've been finding fur and dung and we can tell what they've been eating. So lots of yucca and agave and different types of browse for the Nothotheriops. And then they did carbon isotopes to figure out more of the diet based off of that as well. Moving on to the next slide. And we've even found their fur. Um, so it looks like all the fur that's ever been found from any ground sloth has been roughly a brownish color and uniform. So we've, they've never been able to find distinctive patterns. That doesn't mean they didn't exist on some sloths. It just means that for the ones that we found, they've always been a uniform brownish color. Next slide, please. And then we move on to the Jefferson's ground sloth, Megalonyx jeffersoni. These are also found at La Brea, but there's only been 11 specimens ever found of Megalonyx and we've never found them associated with Project 23 material, which is our current excavation site. They were all found in the early 1900s. Um, and there was only four deposits where uh, Megalonyx was found. Um, but they're actually the most common in the United States out of all of the ground sloths. They have the most fossil localities. It's just they were outcompeted or maybe the habitat wasn't exactly right when they were uh, living in California to come to the La Brea Tar Pits and they didn't get trapped um, as often as other ground sloths did. Um, so what's really interesting about megalonyx is their distribution went all the way up into the Yukon of Alaska and Canada. And it's actually named after Thomas Jefferson because some of the first fossils in the 1700s were brought to Thomas Jefferson and he coined the term megalonyx, which means great claw. He thought it was uh, a predator, a really large predator, and he thought it was still alive, but uh, sort of, uh, he, he described the first versions of it, but other scientists came along and said, no, 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 this is a ground sloth, to, and we're gonna name it after Jefferson because he helped identify some of the first remains. Amazing, okay. <laughs> amazing. Well done, Sean, that was fascinating. So we have a lot of questions coming in from our students. Um, and Haley is wondering why sloths were so big back during the Ice Age. And maybe a too big of a question is why they went extinct. Yeah, so there's a lot of potential mm -hmm. reasons they went extinct. So climate change is definitely a factor. Human hunting is definitely a factor. Uh, there could have been diseases and uh, uh, illnesses that were going around and maybe jumping from multiple animals. Um, and that could have helped wipe them out. Um, and people have even uh, said that, oh, there potentially meteor strikes could have done something, but it seems like the most 
reliable information and evidence that we have is pointing more towards climate change. And then with the climate change, humans are coming into different areas and then the humans are kind of putting the nail in the coffin. Uh, but we don't have direct evidence for all of those species being hunted by humans. So it seems to be a combination of probably multiple factors. And why were they so big? Well, uh, there's a lot of uh, niches and opportunity for animals to get big. And until very recently, we had very large animals all over the planet and they have all been kind of becoming extinct over the last you know, few thousand years. And another really interesting tidbit is those Caribbean uh, island sloths, ground sloths. Uh, they didn't go, some of those didn't go extinct until 4,000, 5,000 years ago in places like Cuba and Haiti um, and uh, Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico and all those places. So very interesting. Absolutely. Um, and you did mention something about um, sloths going in the ocean, which I didn't know. Like that's amazing. Um, and Emmanuel was asking, so did they live in the ocean or did they just go into the ocean to get food? Right. So it seems like they are mostly just going into the ocean to get food. So their seagrasses have, you can still find seagrasses uh, along the coast of Peru. And they would have been diving down and going to find their and forage on those grasses, but they still would have been mating, breeding, giving birth, and probably um, sleeping or denning somewhere on the coastline. Amazing. Um, and then someone wants to know, uh, how did you know that the dung and the fur is from the huge sloth? How do you know what sloth it's associated with? Right, so one thing is they've actually done ancient DNA analyses on some of those coprolites or fossilized poop um, and fur and everything else like that. And they've been able to determine based off the genetics alone. And then also those caves tend, uh, the ones that they've identified specific remains from tend to only have one species of sloth in as far as the bones. And so it kind of, you put two and two together, the bones and the fur and the dung are all from the same species but also the genetics has also proven that as well. So it's definitively true now. Okay. And then Karis is wondering why they move so slow. We've all seen those modern day sloths that move very, very slow. Did the Ice Age sloths move just as slow? And why are they very slow moving? moving? No, probably not as slow as the modern day tree sloths. So the modern day tree sloths have uh, evolved and adapted to a very specific niche and environment and they hang from trees and try and camouflage themselves and they try and not move whatsoever. Even when like a loud sound or a screech goes by, they don't even react to the sounds usually. And that is all defensive mechanisms to try and not move as much as possible, be as energy efficient as possible. So there's a variety of reasons and uh, details that go into that because the, what they eat is very toxic, those, those leaves have a lot of tannins and terpenes and phenols and different chemicals that are really nasty uh, and can kill mammals, uh, but their slow rate of consumption and their digestion um, and the fact that they're so slow actually helps break that down and make it safe for them to continue to live based off of that nutrient poor diet. Other sloths, uh, such as ground sloths, and there was over a hundred genera um, have been identified. So many, many more species have been identified based off of that throughout the evolution of sloths. And they uh, adapted to different types of environments, adapted to eat different types of things. But the basis of it is they all had very low metabolic rates. Um, they, uh, their thermoregulation is totally different than other mammals um, and all of that. So they definitely were slow. The ground sloths were not fast. They could probably, their fastest speeds were probably like a quick walking pace of a human. Um, so their defensive strategies and digestive strategies and everything seem to be going towards a very slow lifestyle, um, but still being able to be very, very extremely successful. So just because they seem like slow, dumb animals, that's not true at all. They've just adapted in a different way that makes perfect sense. Um, they have a huge diversity and they are one of the most successful mammals out there. Yeah, very, very successful. That's great. I didn't know half of that stuff. And I work at the Liberator. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> um, and then just our last question, just to wrap up today. So some students are wondering more about your job and what you do. What you enjoy most about your job? And is it difficult? 
So discovery is the best part of my job. So I get to work here with a bunch of great people, all my coworkers, a bunch of volunteers, um, and we get to uncover fossil evidence uh, from right now, our project in Project 23 is about 30 to 50,000 years old. Um, so we're finding stuff that's relatively that old. And uh, we don't get to just deal with sloths. We deal with proboscideans, mammoths, mastodons, saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, uh, dwarf pronghorn, uh, plants, insects, everything. The whole big, huge portions of the ecosystems are being preserved, but just their hard parts because of the chemistry break, just breaks down all the soft elements of all of those once living organisms. So we're just left with the hard parts and we have millions and millions of fossils and millions more to go through. And I just consider myself very lucky to be able to do that. The difficult part is excavating is sometimes difficult, especially like here in Box 13, it is so asphaltic. There's so much tar um, and they're so dense, so densely packed on top of each other. What you're seeing right here is thousands and thousands of fossil remains all just jumbled in on top of each other and mixed around. And when the asphalt is hard um, and there's a lot of fossil remains, we have to go really slowly in order to excavate all of those remains out safely. So a level, a 25 centimeter level uh, in this box can take us anywhere from six months to a year to finish. It's so uh, meticulous. Wonderful. But it's Thank great. Thank you so much, John. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to spend the morning with us and all of our students. You know, you have a lot of work to do out there. I love fossils to excavate. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, we're wave, say this is a pair of my lid on hand and I'm wave goodbye to you. <laughs> so these are all real fossils that were found at La Brea. Thank you so much. See you later. Um, so thank you to all of our friends and students for joining us this morning. We learned so much about ancient sloths. So if you want to see more from our fossil preparators, give them a follow on Instagram at La Brea Tar Pits. We'll also have all the videos from these presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. You can catch this recording and others at youtube.com slash La Brea Tar Pits. Thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.